Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi, a freshman at UCLA and also the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, an MSNBC legal analyst and the author of The Watergate Girl, about my experience during that trial. And since we're talking about um, a book today, I thought I'd mention mine as well. But today, um, we're not that far from January 6th which was a wake-up call to anyone who hadn't been paying attention before then. Insurrectionists fed lies for years by Donald Trump, stormed our Capitol, and made it clear to America that terrorism is no longer something from beyond our borders. Domestic terrorists and violence are now part of the American way. Uh, Everything from QAnon to Proud Boys and so-called militia groups Um, So we're very excited that we now have a guest who can address those issues. There are reports, in fact, that people are talking about having another big attack this month. And we want to hear all about that from our guest. Our guest today, John Brennan, has insights and answers for us about the security risk facing our nation from threats at home, as well as from abroad and how to best deal with those threats. He was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and was one of President Obama's most trusted national security advisors for the full Obama administration. Before becoming director in 2013, Brennan worked in the CIA from 1980 to 2005, specializing in Middle Eastern affairs and counterterrorism. He then started a consulting firm before returning as Obama's uh, Homeland Security Advisor from 2009 to 2013, and then served as CIA director until 2017. This means that he served three Republican and three Democratic administrations. Since leaving government in 2017, he has been a really visible and vocal commentator on national security for MSNBC and wrote a highly relevant book called Undaunted, My Fight Against America's Enemy at Home and Abroad, which I learned is the same publisher, it comes from the same publisher as Jill's book. So first, thank you so much for being here, John. It's a real honor and we look forward to this discussion. Well, thank you, Victor and Jill, for the very kind invitation. I I look forward to the discussion. It's not as though there's any deficit of things to talk about, about what's going on in our country and the world today. So I I do look forward to engaging with both of you. You are so right. There is a lot to talk about. And you have been involved in fighting terrorism for a long time. So I want to focus on that first. And When you first looked at it, was domestic terrorism part of what you were looking at, or were you focused solely on international terrorism? Well, as a CIA officer uh, for the first 25 years of my professional career, uh, our focus uh, in CIA is abroad. We have foreign intelligence responsibilities and capabilities. And so therefore, I was focused on foreign terrorist organizations, whether it be Hezbollah, or the various Palestinian terrorist groups uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, And then uh, a lot of the Islamic extremist uh, organizations uh, that purport to be Islamic, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Al-Shabaab, and and others. So I was looking at the international environment and the connections between them. Uh, So it was when I joined uh, President Obama in 2009 at the White House, when my portfolio was Homeland Security, that I then was focused on what was happening here in this country, not just the uh, efforts of Al-Qaeda and other foreign terrorist groups to carry out terrorist attacks domestically, but also violence perpetrated in our homeland by individuals who grew up in this homeland. And and so it it really did allow me to have more of an introduction uh, to that domestic uh, violence perpetrated by these many of the right-wing white supremacist groups. Uh, I also had an opportunity when I was uh, a CIA officer uh, and had the opportunity to stand up the National Counterterrorism Center working closely with my FBI counterparts, Mm -hmm. who obviously have been focused for their entire history on uh, domestic violence. So uh, again, my experience on the international front really helped, I think, give me some background and understanding of some of the phenomena and factors and conditions that contribute to those violent acts. And on January 6th, when it became apparent to everyone that we were in a new era. Um, Did anything really change for you on that day? Or was this something that you were so well aware of since at least 2009, when you were working for Obama, that 
you knew this was coming for a long time? Well, I, I knew that there was a growth in these radical domestic groups, uh, the militia groups, white supremacist groups, and others. But I never imagined during the Obama administration that we would subsequently have somebody in the White House who would incite uh, violence, quite frankly, by these groups and would encourage them to take their fight uh, all the way to the Capitol. So on January 6th of this year, I was uh, shocked, uh, not at the fact that we had individuals willing to carry out these types of, of violent attacks, but that they were encouraged by not just a person in the White House, but also by many members in Congress. Uh, I, I do think that incitement really contributed significantly to that insurrection that we saw on that day. I, I agree completely and, and feel that this was different in a way because it wasn't just violence. It wasn't um, against a particular person. It was against our government. It was to stop the constitutional responsibility of the Congress and to interfere with the election. And that puts it in, for me, a, a different category and makes me wonder are there changes to our laws that we need as a result of this? Are there new investigative tools that we need? Is there a new focus at any of our government agencies? What would you recommend? Well, I think there's still a lot to be known about the events that led up to the January 6th assault. And, and I do think it's critically important, just as we did after the 9-11 attacks, to have a very thorough review and investigation about all of the different features uh, of this attack so that we can address the concerns. And as you point out, there may be issues related to um, additional statutory authorities that we need to give to the FBI or to other law enforcement and security agencies so that they can uncover uh, these types of activities before they manifest themselves in the ransacking of the Capitol. There may need to be some different practices and, and policies in, in place, taking advantage of existing laws. But also, um, I'd like to think that we will never again uh, elect into office uh, someone like Donald Trump, mm. who really had such disregard and disrespect for the rule of law, because despite the wisdom and the foresight of our founding fathers, I don't think they imagined somebody that would be a president of the United States who would, as you point out, try to undermine our democratic processes and try to uh, perpetuate uh, his um, staying in the presidency beyond what he was uh, entitled to. What you're saying is is very relevant to um, a recent guest that we had uh, and her comments. This was Secretary Madeleine Albright and her new book about fascism. And she defined fascism as a process, not an ideology, and said that until recently, one of the essential elements of fascism was missing, and that was violence. And she said, now, of course, we have that. Um, and so domestic terrorism may be moving to a much more dangerous um, definition now. Oh, can you comment on that? Do you, do you agree with her? Yes. Uh, I think when the events of January 6th were unfolding, there were a lot of questions about whether this is domestic terrorism. Well, I think it was a lot of things that day. There were individuals who were protesting, as is their right to do, and they could have done that uh, very peacefully and, and not engaged in any type of violent activity. Uh, clearly, there were uh, some pipe bombs that were placed, uh, IEDs, near the Democratic and Republican national uh, offices here in Washington. Uh, and there was the, the use of, of horrific types of violence that were perpetrated uh, in the assault uh, on the Capitol. And so I do think that uh, some of that activity certainly uh, falls within that category of domestic terrorism. Um, now, it's you know better than I do, Jill, uh, being a, uh, a lawyer uh, and, and trained in the law, uh, that there are a, a variety of, of criminal statutes that can be applied in cases like this. And that's why I do think it's important that this investigation be very rigorous, be thorough, and, and clearly bring charges against those individuals uh, for whatever um, activities they engaged in that were against the, the laws of this country. 
up to including the ringleaders, uh, the ones that were bashing through the windows and the doors of the Capitol, but uh, those that incited insurrection, which in my mind is, uh, is sedition. And I agree with you. In terms of investigation, you're focusing, it sounds to me, more on the criminal possibilities, but um, we now have the possibility of a 9-11 style commission to look at this. Do you think that that would help as well? Well, I, I, I think that there are a number of avenues that can be pursued. And I know that Speaker Pelosi has initiated a review uh, asking uh, former General Honoré to lead a, a security review of what happened on that day. Uh, there are congressional hearings that are ongoing uh, as we speak. Uh, but also I think that we shouldn't just be looking at what happened tactically on that day. We need to take a broader, more strategic look, the way the 9-11 Commission did on the 9-11 attacks, and to see not just, uh, again, the, the manifestation of that violence on that day, but what are those contributing factors, the lack of preparation and preparedness, the intelligence system that worked or didn't work, uh, what are the training uh, and, and other types of, of capabilities that are necessary in order to uh, prevent these types of uh, actions from taking place. And again, taking a, a broader, more strategic and systemic look at what happened. And so whether you call it a 9-11 commission or something else, I do think it's important that it be bipartisan. This is something that is not in the preserve of one party or the other. It really needs to be done as a a good government initiative, uh, bringing together people with the requisite experience, expertise, as well as determination to get to the truth, as opposed to making political points. Right. And I think we'll talk more about that, but I want to stick with the events of January 6th for just a bit, because um, it seemed different to me than Charlottesville or even the threat to Governor Whitmer, uh, partly because, as you've noted, it was egged on by the President of the United States. They were armed and they stormed the Capitol and did severe violence uh, that led to death of five people. Um, they were yelling, hang Pence, and wanted to kidnap Pelosi, uh, Speaker Pelosi. And, and I think this is key. They did this in an effort to overturn a free and fair election and to stop our government in its uh, doing its duty. So. Um, it, you said the word insurrection, and I want people to understand that this wasn't just a protest. It wasn't a riot. It was insurrection. It had a purpose. Um, do you agree with that? And has there been anything like this ever in our history that you're aware of, either from foreign or domestic terrorists? Well, it, it, people are using a lot of different terms. I think insurrection is an appropriate one. I think an attempted coup by Donald Trump is another one. Because as you point out, there was, I think, a free and open election. And it was quite evident that Joe Biden prevailed in that election in terms of having the sufficient number of electoral votes. Uh, and the dishonesty that was coming out of not just the White House, but also by members of Congress and senators who were leading the charge, the, the Josh Hawleys and the Ted Cruz's, who knew that there was not the type of fraud and wide scale corruption that uh, Donald Trump was alleging and were intentionally misleading, misinforming, and I think propagating disinformation for the express purpose of generating this type of activity in Washington on January 6th. And so I, I do think it was something that was unconscionable. And quite frankly, I've been fed up with politics for, for a long time. And I, I understand a lot of politicians engaged in embellishments, whatever else, but this purposeful, um, misleading, dishonest uh, commentary and narratives that they were putting out was, I believe, directly responsible for the rising crescendo of, um, of anger that, again, manifests itself so violently uh, in the Capitol on January 6th that, again, was designed to prevent the peaceful transfer of power from one administration to the other. And from a historical standpoint, I cannot think of any other precedent where an incumbent in the White House actively engaged in this type of seditious uh, activity. So uh, it's just, again, uh, unimaginable uh, that uh, we would have had to endure something like this because of the activities 
of the person who was at the White House. And in hearings um, in February 23rd, um, you had the leaders of all the law enforcement agencies involved, the Capitol Police, the um, uh, Metropolitan Police of District of Columbia, the Sergeants of Arms, of both the House and the Senate. And it seemed to me like they were blaming each other and weren't really getting to who was responsible and particularly for the lack of preparedness and the lack of a speedy response in terms of dispatching, for example, the National Guard. And so from your expertise, what do you think was available from the CIA and from the FBI uh, in terms of intelligence that might have led law enforcement to take a different response? Well, I think the um, federal agencies that would have been responsible for providing support to the Capitol Police and to the authorities uh, responsible in the district for keeping order that day would have been, first and foremost, the FBI, as well as the Department of Homeland Security. Department of Interior as well, because of park police and other things. But mm -hmm. the FBI and DHS really have the capabilities, including on the intelligence front and on the assessment front. And it is, it's apparent, I think, from some of those testimonies that there was a breakdown in terms of um, intelligence that uh, was available within the FBI. It was some tactical intelligence that was coming from their office in Norfolk about plans of individuals to actually carry out violent acts on January 6th. It made it to the Capitol Police Command Center, but it didn't get to the leadership. So intelligence is not an end in itself. It really needs to be used. It needs to be made available to the right people. But I think there were a variety of, of uh, issues uh, that really need to be addressed. It wasn't just the lack of tactical intelligence getting to the right people. I think the storm clouds were brewing for quite some time. Um, I don't think you needed to be a real intelligence analyst to understand that there are going to be thousands of people that were going to be coming into the Capitol. They were going to be angry. They were going to be egged on by Donald Trump. And so the potential for them to engage in violent acts, I think it was readily apparent. When I looked at the Capitol on January 6th as that uh, was unfolding, I was surprised at the very limited security measures, the physical security measures that were in place, the very the, the small barriers that were used. The, you didn't have the barricades. You didn't have the, the forces in, in numbers. Uh, and clearly then there was the delay in calling upon the National Guard to augment the forces that were there. There was a, a lack of preparation, a, a lack of uh, security measures that were put in place. Uh, insufficient number of forces. Uh, the the Capitol Police that I saw, I don't think were sufficiently uh, armed and uh, equipped to deal with that type of uh, crowd. Uh, and then I think there was just a, a lack of leadership from the standpoint of not being able to marshal and orchestrate the various capabilities that do exist in the district in an effective and timely manner. And so it, it runs the gamut from taking a look at intelligence uh, availability to dissemination, to security preparations, to the perimeter security measures that were not in place, to the inability uh, of the mayor to, to call upon the National Guard because the, the mayor of the District of Columbia doesn't have the same types of authorities as governors do. And so I think that's why there's a broad array of issues that need to be looked at because in incidents like this, it's usually, almost always, never one issue in terms of why things didn't work out the way they, they needed to. It's a broader array of missteps, uh, lack of preparation, lack of capabilities. And that's why I do think it's important to have a very thorough and rigorous review. It, it certainly seems that way to me. You had the acting Secretary of Defense sort of uh, refusing to allow the dispatcher the dispatch of um, troops. You had the FBI sending an email to the chief of police uh, at 7 p.m. the night before the insurrection, giving him information that clearly called out for, you at least make a phone call and make sure he hears it and knows it. It was that serious. So the intelligence existed. It just wasn't communicated. and. Um, you know, you have um, some of the groups identified as being part of the January 6th insurrection, um, explicitly recruiting law enforcement officials. And so um, one of our other past guests, Frank Vigluzzi, has talked about um, the need for a domestic terrorism law so that 
the FBI has the tools it needs to be able to investigate these alt-right groups and what they're doing. Um, do you think that's a good approach? I think it's certainly worthy of serious consideration to take a look at what additional tools, statutory authorities that the FBI might need to look at uh, domestic uh, violence uh, activities, uh, activists, whether it be on the right or the left or whatever, that there needs to be uh, the ability of those organizations that we rely on to appropriately investigate these uh, types of activities before they manifest themselves in violence. Now, at the same time, we want to make sure that we continue to respect the, the privacy and civil liberties and the rights of all Americans. And so, you know very well, it's a, it's a very, very delicate balance, particularly when you start getting into the areas of social media. Uh, obviously, technology has just uh, revo revolutionized the way we conduct our lives. And a lot of our laws have not kept pace with the technological advancements that we've been able to take advantage of. And so what should the government's role be in that digital environment, that social media environment, when the government does not control that digital environment? It's the private sector that does. But what should the FBI or DHS or NSA or other entities do in order to monitor activity there and then be able to act upon it? So these are very, very uh, complex issues, and I do think that there needs to be uh, a very careful review of what updates we need to be able to make to our laws and our capabilities in light of the transformative nature uh, of technology today. And we also have some very serious um, alt-right groups that have formed the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, QAnon, um, spreading disinformation, conspiracy theories, um, and they were trumpeted by Donald Trump. But now that he is gone from office and off Twitter, do you think that they will be able to maintain the same power that they've had up till now? Well, I think there's a very active um, communication system among a lot of these groups. And unfortunately, even though Donald Trump no longer has a Twitter account, there are others who do. And continue to use their pulpits to propagate these types of conspiracy theories. Senator Ron Johnson continues to just amaze me at, at how much he gets into these conspiracy theories and um, making it seem as though they're real. So even though QAnon and some of the others do not necessarily have the same sort of prominence that they had during the Trump time, that doesn't mean that they're not still very active in social media, on the dark web, maintaining communications, continuing to make plans to agitate and to uh, cause trouble. So I, I don't think we should feel reassured at all just because Donald Trump is no longer in the White House that we still don't have a problem with a lot of these groups that I think are dedicated to um, carrying out um, activities, uh, vigilante activities. Uh, against uh, government, against those trends that they object to. Uh, they're very xenophobic. They're anti-immigrant. They're nativist. Uh, a lot of them are very racist. Uh, and so therefore, they are very um, uh, susceptible, I think, to um, triggers that uh, are set off by, uh, unfortunately, uh, politicians and others who um, send signals that these individuals have to take matters into their own hands. I, I agree with you about Senator Johnson, and I'd add to that uh, Cruz and Hawley and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who are um, part of emboldening these alt-right groups um, and taking on the mantle from Donald Trump. Just going back to the 9-11 Commission, I think that's a really um, crucial point. You know, you mentioned that we have to investigate what happened and prevent um, what happened on January 6th from ever happening again. Many in my generation, I think it would find it useful for you to kind of explain what the 9-11 Commission was and kind of what its basic structure was and what its basic findings and results were. Well, the 9-11 Commission um, was brought together because of the horrific nature of the Al-Qaeda attacks perpetrated on our country on September 11th of 2001. And I think it became evident in the aftermath of that attack that the U.S. government um, did not um, acquit itself. 
the way it should have in the, the months and years prior to 9-11 in order to guard against these types of attacks from taking place. So the 9-11 Commission was an independent bipartisan commission that was headed up by prominent former government officials, Lee Hamilton, Congressman, uh, and Tom Keene, a former governor of New Jersey. Uh, and again, it was bipartisan that uh, had a full staff uh, that was authorized and uh, funded uh, by a result of Act of Congress and uh, carried out a series of uh, interviews and investigations into trying to find out what actually contributed to what was seen as the failure of the U.S. government to prevent that attack from taking place. And so there were a lot of testimonies and open hearings. I testified both in open hearings as well as in uh, private uh, classified interviews. Uh, and then the 9-11 Commission, the team members, pulled together a report uh, laying out uh, what they uncovered as far as the various uh, activities of the 9-11 hijackers, what they did in order to uh, defeat the, uh, the radar of the U.S. Uh, government uh, and to carry out these attacks. What were the vulnerabilities that the 9-11 hijackers exploited? What were the obstacles to uh, sharing information among government agencies, such as between the FBI and the CIA? And the 9-11 Commission then came up with a series of recommendations, most of which were implemented by the Bush administration to reorganize, reconfigure, and to take some very uh, significant steps to, again, facilitate the flow of information between and among the various federal agencies uh, in, that are involved in counterterrorism activities, to uh, support uh, the better flow of information from the federal government to state and local officials. And uh, so there was a series of, of laws that were passed, most notably the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, which again set up new organizations such as the Office of the Director of National Intelligence mm -hmm. and directed that there be uh, certain uh, changes made to the processes uh, of uh, intelligence and, and the national security establishment. And so it was very worthwhile a review that resulted in very tangible and important steps that I think went a long way to addressing some of those uh, shortfalls and um, failures uh, that, again, contributed to those attacks on 9-11. Let's shift to the January 6th Commission, which aims to kind of do a similar thing, which is to examine the cause of the insurrection and provide recommendations on how to prevent such an attack on our government from happening again. Um, Mitch McConnell has already kind of reported or, or said that he thinks that the commission is political by design. And I'm wondering, you know, given what he has said already, do you think Speaker Pelosi can get a commission underway now, even though Mitch McConnell is reportedly uh, opposing it? Well, you know, I'm kind of surprised. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> something that Mitch McConnell does, certainly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I think if people look back on the 9-11 Commission, they would not say that was political. I would say that was good government at its very best. Uh, and uh, there was this very strong bipartisan, if not nonpartisan, effort to try to get to the truth and, and try to make reforms in the government that were going to prevent the recurrences of those types of attacks. And, and so... Um, I, I do think that you can find people from both sides of the aisle who will set aside any type of partisan agendas to ensure that uh, we take the necessary measures and steps to prevent uh, another insurrection from gaining that type of traction that led to the ransacking of the Capitol. So um, I believe that it, it can be done, it should be done. Again, whether you call it a, a formal independent bipartisan commission, but I, I do think something has to be done that is going to be much more than just a review of the events of that day. It needs to look more systemically at what were those contributing factors that really led up to that you know, debacle on that day. I think one of the issues that needs to be looked at is during the Trump administration, it was clear that the federal government's interagency process and interactions atrophied badly. And there was not the type of, of communication and interaction 
uh, during the Trump administration among those different intelligence security uh, organizations as there was during the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton and, and others going way, way back. And so uh, you, there may be an effort to try to better institutionalize uh, these types of interactions as opposed to letting them atrophy so badly because you have uh, an incompetent uh, individual at the White House who who prefers not to have a rigorous government process, but prefers just to have more of an authoritarian hand in making these decisions. Yeah, part part of Mitch McConnell's um, statement, which I happen to agree with him on, is just the fact that currently as it's structured, I think uh, Speaker Pelosi has it seven Democrats and four Republicans versus the 9-11 Commission, which, as you said, was a bipartisan commission with half and half Democrats and Republicans. Do you think that what Nancy Pelosi is doing is a mistake in, in terms of the number of Democrats and Republicans being um, not balanced? Yeah, I have not looked into thoroughly what Nancy Pelosi, all the details of her proposal. I, I know that there is concern about this imbalance between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I do think, not, aside from just the perception, but also the reality, I think the greater balance and equity there is from both sides of the aisle, I think the more it will be uh, welcomed and uh, viewed as uh, as legitimate, balanced, and uh, bipartisan. And I, I do think that 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 makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so much of the the nine the nine eleven commission was not only to investigate it, but also to make recommendations to Congress. And I assume so is the um, January six one. But the one difference is that now we're living in such a polarized moment. And you talk about this in your book as well, how polarized we are. What do you think it will take to get support from both Democrats and Republicans in Congress, and to get the public to accept the findings of the commission and to actually make those recommendations um, once they're submitted to Congress? Well, I think you have to have people of stature, and uh, I think it's also important to have uh, people who have deep experience in uh, government so that there is almost an immediate legitimacy that is uh, assigned to this this effort. And that's why Lee Hamilton and Tom Keene were, were chosen. They, they were respected by both sides of the aisle. And I, I think you have people like that who would be willing and eager to engage in this type of, of review and, and commission-like work. So the, the Pelosi initiative could take a look with General Henri at what happened that day in a very sort of limited way. But I think if you're really going to do this thoroughly and well, uh, you, you want to do something akin to what were the, the features and aspects of the, the 9-11 Commission. Again, bringing people in, uh, maybe former leaders from both parties uh, in Congress. Congress tends to uh, have a you know uh, respect toward members who you know walked through their hallowed halls before, but you also have people again from previous administrations who I think have the depth of experience as well as have the respect on both sides of the aisle that that could engage in this type of, of review. You're in a unique position because you have looked at both domestic and uh, foreign terrorism. Uh, starting out, as you've pointed out, the CIA focuses on the international uh, front. What is the greatest um, international threat to us now? Well, the, the challenge for the United States and the national security team is that the United States has unrivaled responsibility around the world. And uh, the, the, the United States has to be concerned about uh, superpower relations with Russia and China has to be concerned about proliferation in North Korea, Iran, other places. Uh, instability in the Middle East are, are, are forces that still remain in Afghanistan and Iraq, a situation in Syria. Uh, I will go back to the issue of cyber. I, I do believe cyber is not just a real serious issue as far as our domestic uh, security is concerned uh, and political stability. I do think it's a very important international issue, particularly since most human activity these days takes place in that digital environment. Again, it runs the gamut from trade and business and financial activities, communication, education, uh, with the proliferation of cryptocurrencies. And for all of the benefits that accrue to us as a result of that digital environment, that World Wide Web, 
there are malactors that seek to exploit opportunities there to uh, engage in activities that uh, not just uh, skirt laws, violate laws, but also undermine uh, our law and order in countries around the globe. So I, I do put cyber in the digital world in a, in a very uh, special place because I do think it not just holds our security and prosperity in its midst, but also it is the venue for so much malicious activity as well. At the same time, I am very, very concerned about the very serious uh, and insidious ill effects of climate change on international peace and stability. When I think about the, the rising seas pushing coastal communities inland and uh, moving populations across borders as a result of dislocations uh, associated with uh, climate change. Uh, when, I, when I think about uh, the health uh, impacts of global emissions, uh, there is just so much that will have uh, ripple effects on governance, on economies, on um, interstate relations. And it, it, because it is so insidious and it sometimes is perceived as, as very slow moving, even though it's not in the grand scheme of things, it's not one of the issues that is tackled by administrations or governments around the globe. Um, and unfortunately, these longer term strategic challenges are too often relegated to the back of the pile as administrations, politicians, and others are looking at the two-year and four-year election cycles and what they need to do in order to get reelected. But I, I do think climate change, the digital domain, um, uh, other issues related to uh, health, pandemics, uh, these are things that really need to start to gain greater prominence and get more attention and resources. Yes, we have to be concerned about counterterrorism. We have to be concerned about counterproliferation and uh, trade issues with China and North Korea, you name it. But I think it's these other issues that uh, might be, again, less tangible and, and less prominent on the, the headlines of the papers. These are the ones that really require some, some serious and dedicated uh, attention. You've painted a very broad and daunting, um, which no pun intended, a uh, very daunting um, picture of what lies ahead. Is there any chance that you would be willing to step in and help the Biden administration in some way? Well, um, I spent over 33 years in government service. Um, and what I'm trying to do now, one of the reasons I wrote the book is to try to encourage young Americans to give back to this great, wonderful country of ours. And to tell some stories and to explain some of my experiences as a way to entice them to pursue that as a professional career. I continue to uh, talk to a lot of my former colleagues uh, in and outside of government. I'm, I'm ready to help in whatever way I can, but I think my contributions are going to be to continue to mentor and lecture students at my alma maters, uh, Fordham University in New York and the University of Texas at Austin, uh, write some, um, I'm thinking about writing a, another book on some of the, the key uh, global challenges that we'll be facing in the decades ahead. Uh, so I, 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 am, uh, I am enjoying my time with my family, uh, catching up on some of the things that I wasn't able to do during my national security career. Uh, but uh, no, I think I'm going to leave it to others to uh, carry out those full-time responsibilities that are very daunting, but that need good, competent, honest people to, uh, to address them. I know we would love to have you back in government. Um, and I just want to focus a little bit more on your book, which is so timely and informative, not just for this discussion, but for the times that we're living in right now. And one of your major goals in your book is clarifying the function of the CIA, um, given your insider's perspective. I guess for my generation, just tell us what the CIA is and kind of its basic duties. Well, the CIA um, has been in, in place now for over 70 years. And it was set up in the aftermath of World War II in order to be America's eyes and ears around the globe to try to uncover um, those secrets uh, that can, in fact, uh, undermine our national security, as well as those secrets that the United States can use in order to enhance and protect our national security. And so CIA has basically five missions. One is the clandestine collection of intelligence, of importance to our national security. They do that through human sources, as well as through technical means. A second responsibility or authority is conducting the intelligence assessments 
taking the clandestinely acquired intelligence as well as diplomatic cables and other types of things and presenting intelligence to the president and others in terms of uh, so that they can understand what's going on around the world so that U.S. foreign policy formulation has the benefit of those intelligence insights. Another responsibility is engaging in counterintelligence and to prevent the Russians and the Chinese from getting into our systems. And we work very closely with the FBI to protect and prevent uh, those types of intrusions into our systems. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes not. Another responsibility is the conduct of covert action. The CIA is the main U.S. organization engaged in covert action, which is carrying out activities overseas to try to shape foreign events but at the same time, hiding the hand of the United States in terms of those activities. And so the CIA has been involved in many things over the years that have been involved the covert uh, action authorities of the CIA. Then the other responsibility is engaging with other intelligence services and security services around the world. As good as CIA is, it needs to work with a lot of other intelligence security services so that we have the ability to understand these developments abroad. So again, the CIA is composed of some of the greatest you know, uh, patriots as well as experts who um, really are trying to do what they can to keep this you know, great country of ours uh, safe and secure. The CIA has made mistakes in the past. Uh, there have been intelligence failures. There have been policy failures that frequently are attributed to, you know, as in intelligence failures. But uh, I am just so pleased that uh, Bill Burns, um, who is uh, President Biden's nominee uh, for the CIA director, and he went through uh, his confirmation hearing yesterday, I am just so pleased that someone of, of Bill's stature and experience and integrity is going to uh, soon be taking up residence in Langley. Definitely. And we've talked a lot on this podcast about how Donald Trump has done significant damages to institutions like the Department of Justice and the FBI. Um, give us a picture of how much damage uh, President Trump caused to the CIA um, and whether or not, you know, his rhetoric and how much, you know, he cast the CIA in this kind of deep state hurt the institution. Well, I think that, you know, this, the overwhelming majority of CIA officers maintain their professionalism throughout the, the Trump administration's tenure. Uh, I think they were very dismayed and dis disappointed in the fact that a president of the United States would denigrate their work, disparage their profession, and not take advantage of their intelligence as a way to ensure that our national security is going to remain strong. CIA professionals um, want to know that their, their work, their sacrifices, their ingenuity, their innovation matter. That's why they join the CIA, not to be an irrelevant agency. And so I know that uh, morale was affected during the Trump administration years because Donald Trump would take the, the, the views of Vladimir Putin above the views and consensus of the U.S. intelligence community as far as Russian interference in the 2016 election and other things like that. So I know that there was a sigh of relief uh, believing that the Biden administration, especially with the appointment of very competent very experienced individuals, Jake Sullivan, a national security advisor, Tony Blinken at the State Department, Avril Haines as director of national intelligence. Now with Bill Burns at the CIA and David Cohen, my, my former deputy at CIA, serving as acting director of Central Intelligence Agency today. This just has buoyed, I think, the spirits of the professionals, and they are more than eager to do their part to, uh, again, protect this country. It'll be hard, but I think we have the right people in place to really restore morality and integrity. And, and you are an inspiration, I'm sure, to all of those people who are still at the CIA. Um, I suspect that you were not the outspoken person that you are now uh, during your government service, um, that now you feel like you can speak the truth and use your experience to make points that need to be made. Um, what what led to the change? Was it just the election of Donald Trump that made you say, okay, now I'm going to speak out? Well, when I left government service for the second time in January of 2017, um, I had retired in 2005 for three years and worked in the private sector. 
During that time, I was not critical of the, the government, the Bush administration. I had worked in the Bush administration. Now, I spoke out at times when I had disagreements with policy. But when Donald Trump was elected, and then his attitude toward my former colleagues in, in the institution of the CIA, and the fact that he was, I thought, just again, disrespecting the laws of our country, uh, a, a country that I served for 33 years. It was uh, something that just prompted me to, to be outspoken. Throughout my 33 years, I worked hard to defend the right of private citizens to engage in freedom of speech. And maybe I was taking advantage of, of my, the, my labors over the years, but I just felt as though I was, I was obliged. Uh, I was not going to stay silent in, in the face of all of Donald Trump's lies, dishonesty, lack of integrity, and incompetence. And so I know a lot of my former colleagues and you know feel as though I, I shouldn't have spoken out as vociferously as I have. And that's their right to you know say that I, I shouldn't have done it. And a lot of people think I'm partisan. I'm not. Uh, in the book, I say I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, during the Obama administration, it's interesting um, and ironic that it was many of the Democrats that were calling for my resignation or firing. Uh, when I was director of CIA, um, as I defended the CIA against what I thought were some partisan broadsides from the Democrats. So I, I speak out as forthrightly as I can. And sometimes uh, maybe I am not as sensitive to the political ramifications of that, um, which is fine. Uh, I'm not running for office. Uh, I, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. Uh, I, I'm a national security professional, uh, former uh, professional at least. Uh, but again, I, Donald Trump was somebody who I just could not um, stomach as far as what he was doing to this country, trampling um, our uh, democratic institutions and his dishonesty, you know, lack of integrity, lack of competence was just too much for me to bear in silence, which is why I decided to speak up and speak out. Um, and so again, people will will criticize me for it, but uh, I am comfortable uh, having done what I did. And I think that, of course, everything you're saying is what has made you such a very excellent commentator on MSNBC, because you do speak the truth and you are doing it out of a sense of loyalty to the country, not for a political party. Um, but let me ask you about something that's related to what we're talking about, which is what's happened to the Neera Tandon uh, nomination and the fact that despite all of the horrible things that Republicans have posted on Twitter, uh, which they've ignored and thought was OK, they're saying they won't vote to confirm her because of tweets that have been uh, politically um, charged. What do you think? I mean, what what what, what should happen here? Well, I, I think it's a an awful double standard. Uh, and there was a piece in the Washington Post this morning. It might have been by Dana Milbank. It was pointing out that so many um, other nominees uh, during the Trump administration um, had said some really awful things <laughs> about. Uh, individuals that they were critical of, you know, when Jeff Sessions said things and, and others, they seem to all be white males. And all of these individuals were confirmed, including with votes by Joe Manchin from West Virginia. And so it really made me think, oh, is this a double standard that here is obviously a very accomplished woman of color who spoke her mind? <laughs> and sometimes in strident ways, despite the fact that you have the Donald Trumps and the Jeff Sessions and the Mike Pompeos and, and others and looking at the senators, all the things that they say and do, but that's okay. And even voted for a number of these individuals for confirmation for cabinet positions. But when near attendant is nominated for it, all of a sudden the things that she said are beyond the pale. And I do think it's, it's very instructive about how we look through certain prisms differently. She's a woman and she's a person of color. Well, I, I just find it 
um, very, very uh, dismaying that you, you, that you have individuals, and I call out Joe Manchin for this, you should take a look at his, his votes for individuals uh, in the Trump administration who I think uh, engaged in uh, these type of, of rhetoric uh, far worse than, than your attendant did. I want to go back to your book. Um, and in it, you talk about Donald Trump isn't the biggest threat facing our country right now, that it's polarization. Now, of course, I think he is one of the prime factors in causing polarization. But can you elaborate more on that point? Because I thought it was a fascinating one in your book. Well, you know, Donald Trump has been a, a very astute observer in many respects of the domestic political scene. And I think he recognized as he was preparing to have this run for the presidency that he was going to get on this bandwagon of the right uh, of those individuals who, for a variety of reasons, are nativist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, maybe even anti-government, and was going to ride that wave. And I, I do think, uh, let me take a step back here. Globalization, in terms of how this world has become much more interconnected over the course of the last several decades in, in particular, has brought us all together and it's really advanced the human condition. At the same time, the impact of globalization has been very uneven in terms of wealth, income, economic, educational, employment opportunities. And there are a lot of people in the United States that have felt disenfranchised as a result of those dislocations that have occurred the outsourcing of jobs, those um, small towns in the Midwest or where the factories that employed their grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles for many, many years closed because these jobs were being outsourced to be able to take advantage of cheaper labor overseas. And so there's a lot of anger and animus that has been built up in different parts of this country because they see changes taking place that have really not benefited them at all. And they see this influx of people who look differently than they do and pray differently than they do with, in different languages, whatever else. And so they have felt alienated within their own country. Now, I think that has led them to a lot of this, you know, again, xenophobic, uh, and anti-immigrant, and anti-government sentiment. And it's because these very legitimate concerns and grievances have not been, I think, adequately addressed by government. And G Donald Trump and others have demagogued that issue. Rather than trying to describe and explain the complexity of these issues and the need to address them in a much more systematic fashion, um, Donald Trump has, has riled them up and has pointed fingers at these, you know, at the deep state or corrupt politicians or others, and really has done an injustice. And so that split has been taking place between the right and the left, I think, over the course of the last several decades, made worse by the politicians, the corrupt and craven politicians like Donald Trump, that just further polarize the national debate and discussion. And so that's why I say that Donald Trump certainly is symptomatic, but he's also an accelerant of some of the trends that were underway. And and that's why Joe Biden, I think, really recognizes that this growing polarization is just undercutting our country's future. We need to bring it back. But unfortunately, there are people on the left and the right who continue to push in that direction. And I, I do think that there's going to be a need for you know some compromises on some of these issues. But again, these issues that are very complex do not lend themselves to simple solutions. We encourage all of our listeners and watchers to go read that book, learn more about John's experience, because it is really fascinating. I think one that all generations can learn from uh, during this really important time. So thank you so much for being on. We are really grateful and we enjoy the conversation. Thank well, you thank so you, much for spending time with us, John. Yeah. Well, thank you, Victor and Jill. I think what you're doing in terms of intergenerational uh, discussions and is critically important because uh, myself from an older generation, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that as we pass the mantle to the next generations that they will build upon any accomplishments or successes that we've had, but also try to maybe course correct uh, when we didn't get it right. So this type of podcast, I think is critically, critically important. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much for being you. on.